Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel Allende. I'm the Reverend Tom Rossiello, Minister of the Fellowship, and again it's my privilege to welcome you on behalf of all its members. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. Our services are open to everyone, wherever you are. And if you are with us for the first time today or just recently started attending, we especially welcome you. If this is the right spiritual fit for you, you, we hope you'll consider becoming a member of this wonderful spiritual community of justice, service, and love. Today, it is a privilege for Phyllis Culp and me to speak with you on a topic that is very important to both of us and to our faith tradition. We hope our thoughts will inspire and enlighten you. You'll be hearing from Phyllis a little later in the service. It has been a tough week. We come together with so much on our minds, so many emotions and so much pain. It can be difficult to focus. Let us take a breath together. Let our eyes go to the common flame we will now light. Let us prepare ourselves to see what this light the light of justice, the light of love, of compassion, of equality and human dignity can illuminate for us. Let us not be afraid of the light and what it reveals. We're called to see, really see, even the hard things. It's not easy. But we know that this light is also a light of hope that can lead us to new and better places. So let us be one in the light and come together now in the powerful music 
by Bernice Johnson Reagan and Sweet Honey and the Rock. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Oh, how can you rest? We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mothers, sons, is as important as the killing of white. We who believe in freedom and freedom and freedom. The older I get, the better I know that the secret to my going on is when the race are in the hands of the young dead to run against the storm. Not needing to clutch for power, not needing for the light just to shine on me. I need to be one Whoa. in the number that we stand against tyranny. But now we who believe in we believe in freedom and our rest. We who believe in freedom and our rest. You know that struggling myself don't mean a whole lot. I come to realize. I'm a woman who speaks in a voice, in a voice. and I must I be must heard. heard. At times I can, I can be quite difficult to love and so bad to no man's heart. You know that we who believe in freedom and freedom and freedom and We who believe in freedom and freedom and If we believe in that I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes, until the killing of a black man, a black mother's son, is as important as the killing of a white mother's son. And we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I just finished teaching a course to many of you on Unitarian Universalist history. What I hope people took from that class is that our faith has been and must be an embodied faith, a faith that must be put into action that exists in the world, in the streets, not cloistered in some holy corner of a chapel. And central to our faith tradition is the importance we place on freedom and on the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We believe not just in our freedom, but in their freedom, and we cannot rest until it comes. And that is not just because it is right, it is because we are one with them, as members of the only race, the human race. In Dr. King's words, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. We are tied in a single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. You see, 
We believe in freedom and equality. We are a justice-seeking people, so we can't rest until it comes. Yes, we are gentle and loving people, but we too now are angry people. Too many lives lost, too many people of color with a knee on their neck, holding them back, denying them freedom, even killing them. George Floyd and Eric Garner before him and so many others in their last breath of life saying, I can't breathe when they're being crushed to death with a rope around their neck or a white knee on it. I can't breathe are the words that every person of color or every oppressed person or everyone who is denied freedom and justice and equality say in their hearts every day. They feel the weight of that knee every day and we cannot rest until this changes, until this ends. Yes, we're a peace-loving people, but also an angry people. It is time to march and to pray and to vote and to speak out. It is time to raise our voices in powerful songs that remind us of who we are and what we need to do. We are a justice-seeking people, and we are singing for lives, their lives and our lives. Please join Malcolm as he leads us in hymn 170. The words will appear on your screen momentarily. Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Miguel de Allende, a great place to be together on Sunday. I'm Dan Newspiel, the president of this fellowship. 
during this time of both seclusion and protest, you can come here with your entire self, your full identity, your questioning mind, and your heart to share safely in fellowship, reflection, and great music. No matter where you're from or where you are right now, whether you've celebrated religious traditions or not, you're welcome here. Are you interested in joining one of our Zoom discussion groups? You can read further details about them at the bottom of the order of service that you receive by email. If you want more information about these groups, contact Diana Amaya at the email in the chat box. We welcome your feedback on this service. If you have any, please contact Kathy Canepa at the email in the chat box. The third session of the workshop series, Preparing for a Thoughtful Death, we will be presented on Zoom Wednesday, June 10th at 10 a.m. If you haven't already registered, please do so by, excuse me, by sending an email to Diana Amaya. Our Zoom breakout room discussions after the service are great places to reflect on this service and to meet old and new friends. If you want to participate this week, please just stay connected and you'll be randomly assigned to a breakout room immediately at the end of this of the postlude music. Be sure to accept your room assignment on Zoom. If you're in a room with only one or two members, stay put for a few more minutes and I'll reassign you to another group. The rooms will stay open until 12 noon. Choosing this fellowship as your spiritual home is an important commitment. After carefully deciding if UUFSMA is right for you, we welcome you to become an official member by completing a membership form available at our website and making a financial commitment to the fellowship that reflects your financial means and your spirit of generosity. There's more information at our website listed in the chat box. Now, a brief message from our COVID-19 task force. Well, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that as far as we are aware, because of our safe behavior, no members of our fellowship have become ill with COVID-19. The bad news is that cases are on a rapid increase in Mexico and here in San Miguel. As of this morning, there have been reports of 24 active cases here, 37 total, and two deaths. And we know that the actual number is much, much higher. So please, please continue to stay at home whenever possible. If you must leave your home, wear a mask and keep two meters or six feet from others and be prepared at home in the event that you do get sick. The home care guide at covid19sma.com, that's covid19sma.com, is a great resource for this. I welcome your questions and my contact information is in our newsletter and on our website. Now back to Tom and Diego for our covenant. Our covenant will momentarily appear on the screen, and I invite you to enjoy uh, to well join us in reciting it uh, first in English and then led by Diego in Spanish. We respect the interdependent web of life and work for a just and peaceful world. We encourage the search for truth and meaning, strive for compassion in our relationships and seek values that will benefit our lives and the lives of others. This is our covenant. Respetamos todos los estilos de vida dentro de su red interdependiente y trabajamos por un mundo justo y pacífico. Alentamos la búsqueda de la verdad y la comprensión total. Nos esforzamos por mantener compasión en nuestras relaciones 
y buscamos valores que beneficien nuestras vidas y las vidas de los demás. Este es nuestro convenio. We now come to a very sacred time in our service, the sharing of joys, sorrows, and concerns. If you'd like to share one, you may do so also in the chat room uh, at this time. Today, our focus in worship is on the pandemic of racism, but we can not forget that all this is taking place in the context of that other pandemic, the coronavirus. So first, we light a candle for the safety and well-being of all protesters who are following their calling, but surely putting themselves in greater risk of contacting the virus. We pray they'll take every precaution possible. We need them all healthy and alive. We light a second candle for science and research, for all those working night and day to find treatments and vaccines and other ways to prevent, treat, and cure the severe illness this virus brings. Diane and Bob Dupay light this candle for Diana's sister and brother-in-law, Lexi and Skip. Skip is in an ICU unit in Yuma, Arizona, on a respirator, coping with the virus. Lexi is at home with, a, with milder symptoms. We join Bob and Diane in praying for their complete recovery. And we light another candle for everyone who's ill with the virus. I invite you to speak the names of those whom you know that are ill in your hearts now or type them in the chat room if you wish to share, or share them with all of us. Our thoughts and prayers go out to all of them. And we remember now those lost to the virus. We remember what they brought into the world and the huge hole that they have left behind. I invite you to hold anyone that you know who has died of the virus in your hearts now. And again, if you wish to share their name, you may type it into the chat. The candle we lit is for them and for their families who are mourning their loss. We also remember that the normal cycle of life still goes on, even in these difficult times, even apart from the virus. Cliff Durant lights this candle in memory of his lifelong friend and high school classmate, John Smith, who just passed away. He lights it in gratitude that he was able to talk with him at the hospital before he died. This candle is for Cliff's loss and for the beauty of long-term friendships. Many of you have written to me expressing your concern for the cities in the U.S. which you have resided or have a connection to or now live in. It's indeed scary to experience people in the streets and disturbing to see destruction that has taken place. Cynthia Klaus shares, Philadelphia, my city in the U.S. where my family has lived for at least four generations, fell victim to mass destruction, vandalism and burning not only in the center city commercial district, but also in some of the neighborhoods for the first time ever. A small independently owned and operated pharmacy in the art museum area, just one block from my former house and another block from where my daughter and son-in-law live, was vandalized last Sunday night. The owner, Walt, is our dear friend and is a totally wonderful person. Thankfully, he was not hurt physically. This incident has brought the whole situation very close to me. I just learned that Walt has been able to reopen, but I pray for the thousands of Walts around the country who are facing difficult situations and decisions with their small businesses. Kathy and Fran Runchy light this candle saying, please keep the people of Minneapolis in your hearts. We alternate between anger and fear. Last Sunday, we filled five semi-trailer trucks full of donated food at just one of the sites. The people who went to clean up after the fires and pillaging on Lake Street, an area of minority business, were so numerous, the streets were pristine. Our governor proudly extolled the, out, this out, the outstanding aspect of Minnesota. Only if you're white, he said. We light a candle for our leaders, our elected officials, our prosecutors, our police. May they listen, be wise and just and fair, 
open to real change, and may they never lose sight of the worth and dignity of every human being. We light a candle for every person of color who for generations have been victims of racism, for every oppressed person, for every person treated unfairly simply because of who they are. We hold them in our hearts now, those who've lost loved ones to violence, those who fear the ones who are supposed to protect them, those who by faith and love have endured but have not been allowed to truly become who they can be. This final candle for all those joys, sorrows, and concerns that remain unspoken. We now carry all these and the silent struggles in our hearts into a time of meditation and prayer, seeking the hand of love to be our companion and our guide. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn.
This fellowship strives to be loving to each other and to our larger community. And one of the organizations that we support with your donations is Patronato Pro Ninos. On March 13th, following municipal orders, Patronato stopped going out to the rural communities and closed their clinic located in San Miguel on March 20th. They do continue to support close to 150 special needs children with medications and other life-saving assistance in order to survive. They hope to reopen by the end of June with many safety measures. This will, of course, cost money, which was not budgeted for. Patronato Pro Ninos is also a big part of Corazones Unidos. This coalition of NGOs working in coordination with the municipal government, DIF, and Red Cross has been able to provide many staff members to do tasks such as plan logistics, coordinate volunteers, and serve telephone lines for incoming calls to register those who need food. The behind the scenes efforts that have been accomplished by this coalition are monumental and have saved thousands from going hungry. These circumstances have made them work harder and be more creative. Every penny counts as they continue providing much needed services to many children. If you enjoy these Sunday services, please understand that they are not free and are not fully paid for by membership pledges. During the upcoming musical selection, or as I do immediately after the service, please go to our donate link, which you can find in the chat box or at our website, uufsma.org. That's uufsma.org. You may use PayPal, or any credit or debit card to donate any amount. You may indicate on the notes section if you want your donation to go toward our minister's discretionary fund, or you may leave it blank to help meet the expenses of Sunday services like this one, as well as supporting groups like Patronato Pro Ninos. And thank you for your generosity. Now Diego will post an anthem.
Our first reading is from A Testament of Hope by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Whenever I'm asked my opinion of the current state of the civil rights movement, I'm forced to pause. It's not easy to describe a crisis so profound that it has caused the most powerful nation in the world to stagger in confusion and bewilderment. Today's problems are so acute because the tragic evasion and defaults of several centuries have accumulated to disaster proportions. The luxury of a leisurely approach to urgent solutions, the ease of gradualism was forfeited by ignoring the issues for far too long. The nation waited until the black man was explosive with fury before stirring itself even to partial concern. I'm not sad that black Americans are rebelling. This was not only inevitable, but eminently desirable. Without this magnificent ferment among Negroes, the old evasions and procrastinations would have continued indefinitely. Black men have slammed the door shut on a pass of deadening passivity. People of the white West, whether they know it or not, have grown up in a racist culture, and their thinking is colored by that fact. They have been fed on a false mythology and tradition that blinds them to the aspirations and talents of other people. They don't really respect anyone who is not white. But we simply cannot have peace in the world without mutual respect. I think that is the place to start, is in the area of human relations, and especially in the area of community police relations. This is a sensitive and touchy problem that has rarely been adequately emphasized. Virtually every riot has been from some police action. If you try to tell the people in most Negro communities that the police are their friends, they just laugh at you. Obviously, something desperately needs to be done to correct this. Our police force simply must develop an attitude of courtesy and respect for the ordinary citizen. Police must cease being occupation troops in the ghetto and start protecting its residents. Yet very few cities have really faced up to this problem and tried to do something about it. It is the most abrasive element in Negro-white relations, but it is the last to be scientifically and objectively appraised. We now go to Phyllis for the second reading. This is Connecting by Trisha Knoll. I'm white space between black dots. I grew up catching tigers by the toe. School books came with unbroken backs. No one ever called my people X. Families on TV looked like mine. I burn in the sun. I believed money could get me where I wanted to go. I own the land I live on. I was never a melting anything. Fondue, chocolate, molten pot, hot lava lamp or zombie brain. A bubble surrounds me. Shimmer, soap, surprise. I thought it would never pop until it did.
I have sung We Shall Overcome hundreds of times. I've sung it in churches and on streets. I've sung it here with you and hand in hand with black folks. Sung it beside a black mother whose son was killed on the street. And I've sung it marching arm in arm with other gay folks demanding their rights. I've sung it with kids and with old timers. And it's always moved me and given me hope. It reminds me of what our own Theodore Parker wrote in the 1850s and Dr. King so often quoted. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But today, this week, that last word of every line in the spiritual, someday, just jumps out at me. It sticks in my throat when I try to sing the hymn. I want to know, when is someday? When will be the day when racism ends? When will there really be equality for people of color? I don't just mean words of equality on a piece of paper. I mean a time when black women and black men are lifted out of poverty, when their health is as good as their white neighbors, when they're not followed in stores because they're suspected of stealing, when they're not killed on the street by racist police or white vigilantes, a day when a black mother does not have to worry every time her son leaves the house for fear he'll die at the hands of police or vigilantes or street gangs. That's the someday I'm talking about. And I want to know, when is someday? You see, it's, it's been more than 150 years since the abolition of slavery. It's been 60 years since the legal end of segregation and voting rights and civil rights legislation was passed. You'd think we would have reached someday by now, wouldn't you? You heard those words of Dr. King this morning. He wrote those words a long time ago. And what's striking to me is that they could have been written this week. Oh yes, we've made some progress since the marches of the 60s, but we are nowhere near someday. Voices along the way temper progress with gradualism. Don't ask for too much at one time. Give a little here and a little there. Don't rock the boat of white privilege so much that's embedded in so many of our institutions. We saw it literally this week, but for a long time, we've kept the knee of oppression on the necks of black people, and they've not been able to breathe freedom, breathe equality, breathe justice. If you're upset by what was going on this week, I want you to know that I am not. Now, I'm not talking about violence and looting and fires. Of course, I'm upset by them. And I hope they don't overshadow what's really happening the honest protests, the peaceful protests. The U.S. president and his henchmen are trying desperately to divert our attention from what's really happening, trying to spin the story to villainize the heroes, using military force against our own citizens who are just exercising their constitutional rights, and all the while giving a wink and a, and a nod to haters but we see through it, and we know change is coming. I'm inspired by the peaceful protests in the street. I'm encouraged by who I see there, as many young white faces as black faces, and I see people of every color. I'm encouraged by the peaceful protests in the street because when government, our leaders and our institutions, time and time again, turn a deaf ear to justice and fairness, to inequality and hatred, to the legitimate needs of their people, then the people go to the street to be heard. And thank God they have, because someday should have come a long time ago. We're surely not near someday 
when national studies show that young black males have a 21 times greater risk of being shot dead by police than their white counterparts. When one out of every five black men in the United States ends up arrested or incarcerated, often for crimes instigated by police or for such minor offenses that a white person would hardly get a slap on the wrist. You know, I know a bit about this. I was a DA, a prosecutor. I worked with cops. I even depended on police for my protection, especially when I was involved in organized crime investigations. And there are lots of good cops. I was also a criminal defense lawyer, and I saw plenty of racism against my black and Latino clients. And I saw good cops who themselves would never use unwarranted violence towards anyone shut their mouths tight when they witnessed their fellow officers do so. I saw complaints against police officers get swept under the rug by internal affairs departments and citizen review boards stacked in favor of the police. And when finally, in rare cases, it was admitted that a police officer was in the wrong, it was usually written off as an isolated incident or explained in a non-racist way. Police officers are now the focus of racism in the criminal justice system. But this is only where it starts, and frankly, it's a bit unfair to place all the blame on them. You know, I represented men that looked like George Floyd in the courtrooms, and some of them pled guilty because they thought a big, scary black man didn't have a chance with a predominantly white jury. When we did go to trial, I was afraid my black client would get convicted of what we lawyers who did this work used to call the crime of being black in the nighttime. Bet you didn't know that was a crime. You know, I and other white lawyers would try these cases. We'd do it to try to make our clients disappear in the courtroom. We'd stand at places where the jury attention was on us only, and there were no sight lines to the black man on trial. The system has failed people of color for a long time. There were lots of good cops and some bad cops, but that's not the issue. As hard as I worked back then to be a fair prosecutor, or later to challenge cops as a defense counsel, I see something now clearly that I didn't see so clearly then. It was never about this cop or that cop. It was about the system, the entire law enforcement system. From the cop on the street to the level of prosecutorial decision making, to grand juries and trial jury deliberation, to, judici to judicial proceedings and sentencing, and to the treatment of black folks in prison. It was and is all tainted by racism. The criminal justice system is only one of the institutions in our society, though, that is. What about health care and education and neighborhood development? Racism permeates it all. In so many ways, our institutions send the message that black lives don't matter like white lives do. That's why people are in the streets. It's not just about a suffocating knee on the neck of one black man, as horrible as that is. It's about that knee being on whole communities of color. They can't breathe the same air of freedom and equality and safety that white people do. That's why there's protests in the streets. Yes, there has been progress. Yes, on paper, the laws are there. So why, why are we still so far away from someday? It's because we never really dismantled racism at all. We didn't do it in our hearts, and we didn't do it in our institutions. It's easy to con condemn the police, and there's plenty to condemn in the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Aubrey, and all should be held accountable. But you know, it was not really just these officers that failed them. It was the entire system tainted by racism that failed them. 
We, the mostly white folks who are here, who are too fragile to really look racism in the face, who feel our interests are somehow threatened by supporting equality for people of color, that's who failed them. And not just them, all folks of color. I know Phyllis, in a minute, will have a lot to say about why that is and what we can do at the level of the individual, but I want to focus a little more on institutions. We need to completely rethink the criminal justice system and the role of police in our communities. You know, I once thought that just adding black cops to the force would likely solve the problem. But my experience did not prove that to be true. The non-white recruits, few in number, became overpowered by the police culture and unwilling in this sea of blue to speak up for those who are black. They were scared of the personal consequences to their hard-won new jobs. Scared if they rocked the boat, their buddies would arrest their kids. They often, often had no choice but to turn their backs on their community. Sure, it's important that the look of a police department reflects the people they serve. You know, as a prosecutor, I was once involved in the prosecution of a police officer in a case where a Latino man was shot to death by a cop when he was handcuffed in the back seat of a cruiser. It was an execution. But you know what? The cop was also Latino and from the same neighborhood. Just diluting the whiteness of the police departments with people of color, as important as that is, isn't going to do it. I have a question for you. Why are we throwing more and more funds into police budgets and dramatically increasing the militarization of the police by arming them with combat weapons and military equipment? Is that what we fragile white people think will protect us from black people? It seems that's what our president believes. Right now, people are asking for more money for police while cities are cutting things like education, child care, job creation programs, community development, housing. In 2017, the last most recent figures I could find, about $100 billion was spent on policing and another $80 billion on prisons in the U.S. And some cities, hard to believe, but spend nearly half of their entire budget on the police. Do you think this is money well spent? Think of what could be accomplished to make for a more just and equal society if a portion, a quarter, a third of that budget went to programs that helped address the systemic problems created by racism. We need to pause and reevaluate. We need to realign our spending priorities and cut law enforcement and greatly increase those programs that address the underlying reasons for racial inequality. You know, let's be fair to police too. Some of the things that police and courts are handling now have been piled on them and they would be better off handled by other agencies or other groups. You know, drug abuse is largely a medical problem. Domestic problems can be prevented and de-escalated with counseling. Social workers and youth programs, good child care, community development are what we need, not more police presence. Our priorities are just wrong. Moreover, we need to entirely change use of force standards for police conduct, dramatically ramp up real, real civil supervision of police, and require complete transparency. And I'm not anti-union, far from it, but something needs to be done to reduce police union influence on police policy and disciplinary proceedings. We need to entirely recreate the relationship between police and communities. We need peace officers who do not carry multiple lethal weapons. We don't need patrols of neighborhoods in armored vehicles. We need walks in neighborhoods with real conversations. I don't want to fail to acknowledge that these things 
have been happening successfully in a few places, but there's a long way to go. As Phyllis will discuss, we each desperately need to address racism as a personal level, at the level of our thoughts and actions. But at the same time, we also need to address it at the level of our institutions, our cities, our states, our budgets. You know, people of faith, all faiths, not those people who wave a Bible they've never opened and try to use faith as another means of political gain. No people of real faith who take the teachings of their religion seriously know that this racism that permeates our society is wrong. We know people of color in every way are our brothers and sisters. We know when we diminish them, we diminish ourselves. And we Unitarian Universalists are a faith tradition founded on freedom. We proclaim as our very first principle the equal worth and dignity of every person. And we affirm justice and compassion in human relationships. We have no choice but to speak out. And no issue should be of more importance to us than this one. Racism is a reflection of a moral disconnect, something lacking in us and our souls and therefore reflected in our institutions, something that has allowed us to explain things away, to be dismissive, to not feel the pain. And this week, I think white people woke to the pain. Well, what about someday? When is someday coming? We come from a tradition that has long preached the gospel of hope, and I'm hopeful. It feels like something is different this time. For those of you who watched George Floyd's funeral, you saw Reverend Al Sharpton give a eulogy based on a text from chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes. You know it. For everything there's a season and a time for every matter under the sun. Not an uncommon text for many of us ministers to use at a memorial service, but we usually use it to recognize that it was a natural time for that individual to pass on. But Reverend Sharpton used it differently. He saw it as a time for real change. Could this time be an inflection point where the old normal is no longer acceptable? Could this be the time for real transformation? Could someday be near at hand? Could this be the time when we individually and institutionally take a hard look at ourselves and not in baby steps but in giant leaps that make up for lost time, let go of our tainted past and begin anew? For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under the sun. Just maybe this is the season, this is the time to end racism. Maybe, just maybe, this could be someday. And now we go over to Phyllis for her reflection. I'd like to scratch the surface and talk just a little bit about white fragility. I got interested in this when I first tried to listen to the new Jim Crow on Audible. I found myself thinking, why am I reading this? We have elected a black president twice. So I stopped reading it. I picked the book up again a year later and realized how small and narrow I had been. Once again, I learned that I have so much to learn. Let's start with some words by Robin D'Angelo, author of White Fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. In defining white fragility, D'Angelo says, white people in North America live in a society that is deeply separate and unequal by race. And white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality. As a result, we are insulated from racial stress. And at the same time that we come to feel entitled to and deserving of our advantage. Given how seldom we experience racial discomfort in society, 
in the society we dominate, we haven't had to build our racial stamina. Socialized in a deeply internalized sense of superiority that we either are unaware of or can never admit to ourselves, we become highly fragile in conversations about race. We consider a challenge to our racial worldviews as a challenge to our very identities as good moral people. Thus, we perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. That mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. These include emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt and behavior such as argumentation, silence, and withdrawal from the stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort, and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. I conceptualize this process as white fragility. The white fragility is triggered by discomfort and anxiety. It is born of superiority and entitlement. White fragility is not weakness per se. In fact, it is a powerful means of white racial control and the protection of the white advantage. So what can we take from this long definition? White people don't see themselves in racial terms. We have a white frame of reference, a white worldview, and move through the world with a white experience. Those other people have racial identities, not me, not us. We have been socially conditioned since birth. Our first challenge, name our race. Within the social construct of race, let's just admit our race is white. Our second challenge, let's acknowledge racism isn't restricted to bad people, although it's true that some people behave very badly. In the post-civil rights era, we were taught that racists are immoral, mean people who do bad things to other people. But in fact, as Tom has just said, we are all involved in systemic and institutional racism. It's not necessarily intentional but we are an integral part of a racist society. Therefore, we are racist. Racism isn't just about understanding how it is to be black or brown or indigenous in a world dominated by white people. Racism is about understanding white supremacy, our own white supremacy. Our primary goals as white people should be to recognize how the system of racism shapes our lives, how we uphold that system, and finally, how we might interrupt it. We aren't going to interrupt it by acknowledging how lucky we are to be white, or by noting Barack Obama was elected twice, or by saying we, or by saying we have a black daughter-in-law, or black friends, or by being outraged because yet another black person has been needlessly killed or by crying at our own insensitivities and the general injustice and stealing the spotlight with our tears. Poor me, I'm a white woman who feels bad. And we aren't going to interrupt the system of racism by sending a donation to the Southern Poverty Law Center or the ACLU or the NAACP, although those are not bad ideas. We aren't too old to act or too removed to act, or to anything. We are just human. We are all just human. All as important as the next. This is the very essence of all seven of our UU principles. This is the very essence of the do unto others as you would have them do unto you belief. Most of the world says it embraces. Do we embrace these as our principles, our supposed values? Do we really? We are white North Americans living in a continent that has been developing racism over 400 years and has entrenched it solidly. As an example, D'Angelo poses, 
The United States was founded on the principle that all people are created equal. Yet the nation began with the attempted genocide of indigenous people and the theft of their land. American wealth was built on the labor of kidnapped and enslaved Africans and their descendants. Women were denied the right to vote until 1920 and black women were denied to that right until 1964. It's 44 years later. We have yet to achieve our founding principles. Canada, Mexico, other places have similar experiences. How many times do we say or hear, it's Mexico, or it's just Mexico? I said it. How superior is that? We have seen the outrage when Colin Kaepernick silently and gracefully took a knee during the national anthem. His career was ruined for speaking truth. We have seen people murdered again and again. We all know the unfairness of the criminal justice, educational, health, and economic systems in our states, our countries, our world. And we all know who suffers the most over and over and over. We also know what we have to do now. If we aren't a part of the solution, we are choosing to remain a part of the problem. And we are denying all of our UU principles. If we truly want to interrupt the system of racism, we will need to be extremely mindful and to actually change our own assumptions, attitudes, and behaviors. It will not help to feel guilty about being white or being fragile and apologetic or defensive. Being born as each of us were wasn't a choice we made. It just is what it is. But it doesn't have to remain being what it is. And it shouldn't. We can change our own consciousness. To change the system requires all of us to change, and the time is now. There's a racial continuum in our order of service. It looks like this. Uh, most of us will slide up and down it from time to time, but we are all intelligent enough and hopefully honest enough to know where we are on that continuum and to know where we eventually should be on that continuum. I recognize myself at different times and being in many of these categories. When Black Lives Matter started, I even thought, well, all lives matter. Of course, all lives matter. But I didn't fully embrace the message of Black Lives Matter. Now I get it. It's tough to change. Changing takes work, a lot of work. It takes desire, reading, engaging with others, open thinking, developing a higher understanding, trusting, and changing bit by bit. Are we willing to accept who we really are and to accept our responsibility to change? I think we are. And now is the right time to do it. There is momentum and it will build every day with all of us working at it. Let's make now, someday. Thank you. Right now, as that wonderful Detroit choir reminded us earlier, there's a storm passing over cities all over the United States and all over the world for that matter. The ugliness of racism is again revealed, but perhaps with a visceral quality this time, perhaps with an urgency and a poignancy it may not have had before. You know, that choir saying these words, take courage, my soul, and let us journey on, for the night is dark and we're far from home, far from someday. But thanks be to God, the morning light appears. I believe that morning light may be coming from those voices of protesters in the street. It's been a tough week, but we know it's always darkest before the dawn. I considered ending our worship service with us once again all singing that spiritual, We Shall Overcome. But I was stuck on that word, someday. Someday needed to be today. And then I thought, but instead of singing, you know what? we mostly white folks really need to do right now? We need to listen and observe. So I'd like you to focus on every word and every face in this version of that spiritual sung by the Harlem Boys Choir. 
in a, of all places, at a baseball game in Yankee Stadium. And it's a while ago. But I know these boys because they remind me of the boys in our own Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry Program in inner city Boston. Some of those boys may actually be alive today because singing in this choir or being in our programs in Boston kept them off the streets and pursuing their education. But I also know that all of them are also victims of racism. Are they having trouble breathing in the air they need to become all they can be? Is there a knee on their neck? Look at their faces. Look at the faces of the crowd, the military men and women there, the police officer looking a bit uncomfortable. It's all there. Hear the power in their words. They're not singing we shall overcome someday. Listen. They're singing we shall overcome today. Watch how it affects others and be in touch with how it affects you. Please direct your attention again to the area behind home plate and welcome the Boys Choir of Harlem. This 
world needs, what this world needs is peace. Today. We end our service with a benediction, which literally means good words, words for us to take with us for the week. But sometimes we have to end with something stronger, something that sends us forth with hard work to do, sends us forth to act, to put this faith into action. That, my friends, is a charge and not a benediction. We started our service with Sweet Honey in the Rock singing, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We cannot rest until someday comes. So I charge you first not to rest, not to wait for this to pass or go away. I charge you to do the hard work that Phyllis outlined for us, to get beyond our white fragility. I charge you to examine your heart and be brutally honest about how your privilege has sheltered you and made you complicit in racism. I charge you to act in any way you can to change this nation, to change your country, to change the world once and for all. And how do you act? You act with your vote, not just your vote for president or senator, but your vote for local and city councilors and mayors and on local budgets that have been hijacked by groups that out of fear think more and more police and weapons is the answer. You act with your pen or your computer, write a letter, an email to an elected official demanding action. Enough today's, enough delays, tell them someday is today. Many of you living here in San Miguel keep ties with and vote in U.S. cities. Make your voices heard there and everywhere. Speak up when you hear racist overtones and conversations. Do not politely say nothing. Be rude if you have to. Don't let them go unchallenged. Teach what you've learned to others, seemingly well-meaning people who don't get it yet. Educate them about what's happening and recruit them to the cause. Protest if you can safely. Join protests online, sign petitions, support and encourage the protesters on the street, financially, morally, any way you can. We simply cannot let our horrible racist history continue even another day unchallenged. And it's up to every one of us to challenge it. You can't stay out of this. Yes, the waters are troubled now, but you have to wade in the water. Go with the fire of justice in your mind and the compassion of love in your hearts and make a difference in the world. No matter who you are, no matter how old or frail you are, you can do something. And paraphrasing the words of our 19th century Unitarian minister, Edward Everett Hale, yes, you're only one, but you're still one. And you, can do, you can't do everything, but you can still do something. And because you can't do everything, does not mean that you'll refuse to do the something you can do. No, whatever you do with a sincere heart and an honest soul will make a difference. I charge you to go forth and live the values of this faith, of all faiths, to meet the evil of racism, and may peace be with you till we meet again. <laughs>